Romans 5 and 8. It says, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Verse 11 says, and Not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. We want to talk about let the church arise. And the thought for today is we want to share with you is let the church arise from sin. You know, not that necessarily the church is walking in sins, uh, but uh, we need to, there, there's a couple things. If there is sin, we need to arise from it. And, and not only so, but we also need to arise from sin in the sense that uh, no matter what we've done in the past, no matter where we've been in the past, whatever's happened in the past, we need to remember uh, that the sin is covered by the blood. We need to arise from the sin and, and the things that the enemy wants to, to cause you to, to pull you down and to drag you down and to, to say, look who you were and look what you did and look what you've done to looking to the cross of Calvary and remembering that there was an atonement. There, there was a penalty for sin. There was a price that was paid and that you have been pardoned. You have, can walk in grace. You can walk in His fullness. Uh, just like uh, uh, somebody that you know that had committed a crime in the natural, whatever it might have been. It, if the governor pardons uh, the criminal for whatever they have done, then they are free. They're free to go. Jesus paid your price this morning. Jesus paid your price that you could go free. We don't have to go by the way of the cross before we make an atonement before God. We couldn't do it. But Jesus did. He did it for you and I. He did it for the world this morning. But we want to look at the first part of this this morning is sin's curse. It's the separation. It's, it's a cause of a separation. In Genesis 3 and 17, it says, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt, shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and thistles shalt shall it bring forth to thee. Thou shalt eat of the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it was thou taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Uh, many of us know the story. Many of us have heard the story time and time again. It's probably one of the first children's stories. You know, you learn of God's creation and God put in the garden, Adam and Eve. But he told them there was two trees that they could not partake of. Uh, and and, and we, we looked and see that Adam and Eve did not follow through. They did not listen to the voice of God, but they were beguiled by the serpent that, that told them that it was the old devil that came along and said, you know, surely you're not going to die. You know, that, that fruit looks awful good. I don't know how he pulled it off, but, you know, surely, you know, God didn't really mean that. You know, come on. You can take a little bit of it. And, of course, we know Eve took of it, and she gave to Adam, and he took of it, and they realized they had sinned. Immediately they realized that the Bible says that they, they were naked. They didn't have any clothes on. They, they realized, hey, that they, they've done wrong because they had acknowledged, they, they recognized each other in a different way. They saw each other in a different light, if you will. But sin caused a separation. The curse of sin came from the disobedience of Adam and Eve here in the Garden of Eden. It resulted in separation of man from God. It didn't separate God from man. It separated man from God. Uh, you know, because God still loved man. 
God still had, God didn't remove himself from the situation. Man re removed themselves from the situation. It wasn't God that, that caused them to, to fall. It was themselves that caused them, their own selves to fall. But we know this curse uh, was also filled with pain. It talks about, uh, he says that, you know, Eve would have pain in childbearing. It talks about that Adam will work to reap the harvest. He's going to have to get through the, the thistles and the briars and the things that grow up in this. Uh, he's going to have to work by the sweat of his brow. Uh, labor was what he was going to have to do. Uh, and all, ultimately, he tells them, for your dust. And from the dust that you came from, you're going to return to dust. He says you're going to die. All of us are on that road of death. Uh, we might not face it today. We might not face it tomorrow. We might not face it in a few years from now. But we're all facing death. When we're born, we're facing death. It's not nothing that's not, uh, it shouldn't be uncommon to us. It's something we put out of our mind. It's something we put on the back burner. It's something we don't even try to think about. But each one of us are going down a road that we're going to face death. Uh, if Jesus tarries is coming and we don't leave in the rapture, we're all going to face that death uh, because of Adam and Eve. And, and, and like I said, you can't blame them and you ain't going to be able to fuss at them uh, over in the glory land. You're not going to be able to fuss at them at all because, uh, you know, it doesn't matter who was going to be there, they were going to fall. And God knew that. God had, had a way. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. But Jesus had already prepared uh, to come that before the foundations of the earth, it says here in the scriptures. But Looking at this, there was a cause to separation. There was a break in fellowship. God could no longer walk with sin. Uh, God could not fellowship. A holy and righteous God, a pure God, could no longer walk in, with sin. He could no longer walk amongst sin. He was holy. You, you know, and, and there, there's some, and, and probably the devil himself would probably say, well, you know, uh, God thinks he's so much better than, than you, you humans, you poor people down here. But you know what? He is. He is holy. He is righteous. He is pure. Uh, he could not walk amongst the, the evil. He could not walk amongst the, the disobedience. He could not walk amongst the sin. That, that's how separate and how perfect our God is. But, but despite that, it calls the separation. There was no more walking with God in the cool of the day. There was no more conversations with God. It had been broken. It was a separation. And for, to further that separation, as I read, God pushed them out of the Garden of Eden. There was a separation. Sin separates us from God. We learn that not only does the sin's curse, that separation... At that point, in that time, they didn't know. There was no way they could have known. But there was no hope. There was no nothing to look forward to. There was nothing to get excited about. There was nothing really there other than the promise there uh, that, that God said that uh, the serpent would bruise the, his heel, but said his foot would bruise Satan's head. He would destroy his kingdom. There was a promise that was laced in there. But to Adam and Eve, they probably didn't think much about it. They probably didn't even really understand what God was going to do. But God was going to do something. And sin's curse, it separated you and I from Jesus. It separated us from knowing God. It separated us. It was sin's curse. Not only did it affect that separation between us and God, it meant that we could not be where he was at. So the opposite, if you will, the opposite of heaven is actually hell. There's only two places we could end up. And, and, and if we couldn't, if sin separated us from being into heaven, we can't go there. So we automatically go to hell. And, and a lot of people, uh, I've heard the arguments and I've heard the people say, well, you know, I'm a good person and I've done this, I've done that. Uh, in a good way and, and I, you know I try to help people and I try to love everybody and all this and if I get before God and I get before his throne and, and you know uh, I believe he'll allow me in because of what I've done 
But you know, it doesn't work that way. You can be as good as, as soul as you want to be. You can love everybody. You can care for everybody. You can do whatever good deeds you can do. It's not going to get you to heaven. There's only one way, and that way is Jesus. There's only one hope, and that hope is Jesus. Because we could not, that separation that it caused, we are in sin. Regardless of how good we are, regardless of how wonderful a person or human being we are or can be, we are still separated because of the sin of Adam and Eve. Because of disobedience in, in this one thing, mankind, all of us, fell to a place of sin. We're born into sin. It's not something you know you don't want to think about, but that's where we are. So sin is cursed. It, it is a curse upon us. It's all upon this world. Uh, keep in mind, you know, we think about the earth has been cursed as well. There's storms that's here. You know, there's sickness, there's disease, and there's even death. Uh, I think I told you about this maybe, but, you know, just, and I don't remember it, but I was trying to trim up the, the rose bushes and uh, never fails. I get stuck on them somehow or another here and there. <laughs> I get stuck. Gloves and all, sometimes I still get stuck. Ah. But they're, they're rough to be, deal with. But I, I found one of the rose bushes from last year. I was, I was like, I, I don't remember that there was a branch in there. There was a limb in there that was just totally dead. I could not. I knocked it off. Uh, broke it off. It took a little bit, but not much. It was a little struggle. And knocked, broke the limb off and it was dead all the way down to the root. I was like, I don't remember it being bad last year or dead last year. Over the winter. I, I really think it was over the winter. Unless my memory uh, was totally gone. But in, in regardless, why did that die? Because of sin that's in the world. Because of death that's in the world. Why do trees get disease and die? The same reason that people do is because there's a curse on this world. There's a curse on this earth. Uh, you know, I believe that song says the whole earth is groaning and crying for that day of sweet relief. Uh, that re release that Jesus comes back and sets everything back in order. It, it's not like that now. We see sickness and disease and, and birds and animals and trees and even flowers. Things don't grow the way they're supposed to. Uh, all of that is the curse of sin. Sin's penalty ultimately is death. We read about the death that God said that, you know, you're going to surely die. You're going to go from, you were dust, you're going to return to dust. We're going to die. Uh, but there's also a, a spiritual death. And God chose the children of Israel to show that, that separation and chose to show them that sin's penalty was death. Through the children of Israel, he showed them the Bible project says that Israelites, because of their faithfulness of Abraham, because of the faithfulness of Abraham, God's promise to him, uh, they needed a system of some kind that could show do the following things. They needed something that would turn them away from sin, something that would provide just recompense for the great cost of the debt, Something that would provide a way to cleanse and purify the community, specifically the temple, from the infectious nature of sin and ensure that God maintains his presence with his people. That's what the children of Israel needed. They needed something that would uh, that show them what sin was. They needed something that would show them the cost. They needed something that would purify us, even symbolically. It wasn't really that it took away the sins, but the cleansing of the temple. It symbolically, there had to be something that showed all of this. And they had to ensure that God stayed with them. You know, I, I believe that's what the church needs more than anything is to realize that we need more of the presence of God in us. We need more of the presence of God in our churches. We need the presence of God. We can have all the programs. We can do all the songs. We can do all the preaching. But if the Spirit of God is not in us, if the Spirit of God is not moving and the presence of the Lord isn't felt, if God doesn't come down in some way and somehow, what do we have 
but a series of songs and a series of sermons. It doesn't matter. We need the presence of God. We need the Spirit of God. We need the anointing of God. Without it, we don't have a, a church. We don't have the life that is in us. You know, I, I think about it. You know, I, I think about myself. You know, when I was talking about this morning in the Sunday school hour, uh, talking about how that, you know, uh, we think about uh, uh, Jonathan Edwards. I'll get it out in a minute. Jonathan Edwards and the, his sermon on, in Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. You know, I, I told you I was used to Pentecostal preachers. I was used to preachers that, that didn't read a lot of text or, or didn't read a lot of uh, notes and things of that nature. But yet, the spirit and the power and the presence of God was there and was felt. But I, and so Jonathan Edwards to me was strange when I first heard about it and I first read it and I was telling you about how that he read this sermon word for word and yet the spirit was so great, the conviction was so powerful that people felt like they were slipping into the pits of hell at that very moment. And, you know, that was to me kind of different. That was un unusual. Then I realized, you know, God can work any way he wants to work. But we need his presence regardless of how he wants to work. Amen. Regardless if we shout. We can't swing from the chandeliers no more. We done took care of that. <laughs> there ain't none here. <laughs> But we can still shout. We can still praise God. We can still worship Him. But we need His Spirit. We need His presence. How was that going to take place? God chose animal sacrifice for the Israelites. And if you think about this, the cutting, and this may be a little gross, but just bear with me here. Just cutting an animal's throat and watching its blood, that is its life, drain from its body. It was a, a visceral uh, symbol. And, and visceral, if you don't know what that means, it's, a, it's not intellectual. It's, it's instinctive. It's unreasoning or dealing with crude or element of uh, raw emotions, if you will. Uh, visceral is just the basic needs. It's, it's kind of like a, uh, sometimes what uh, me and Dave talks about. Sometimes we're just barbarians, you know. We're just <laughs> we're barbaric in what we do sometimes, you know. We're crude sometimes. That's how humans are. You know, we're sometimes we're crude. Sometimes we're rude. Sometimes we're barbarians. Uh, this was dealing with it. It was not intellectual. It was survival. It was instinctive. It was a symbol of devastating results because of sin and selfishness. And you could call that element alone a symbol or a deterrent for their sins. To, you know, do you think if you had to... If you sin and here you got to take and kill an animal and watch it bleed to death, watch it die because of what you've done, wouldn't that be an awful thing to have to witness? You would think that that would be a deterrent. Well, I better not sin because I don't want to take a, maybe old Betsy outside that was my pet cow and, and take it in and have it sacrificed unto God. You know, you'd think it would be a deterrent. You'd think that that would be uh, something that would cause them to think and maybe it did to start off with. But like everything else, they got used to it. Like everything else, they got, all, they got in, in, uh, just hardened by the fact that they just went through it. And it was ritualistic. And so they did it. They moved on. Just like all the, all the other religions, there was other religions that sacrificed animals. There's also other religions that sacrificed their own children. It became ritualistic. They didn't really look at the price of sin. But we know that the blood, God told the children of Israel in Leviticus 17, says, For the life of the flesh is the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. The blood, the life, makes an atonement for the soul. Sin's since blood represents life or the opposite of death, it's the sprinkling around the temple that would act like a detergent. It can symbolically wash the temple of death and the natural result of sin and defilement. If sin, you think about this, if sin vandalizes God's world with death and pain, 
God has every right to make the people face the just consequences. He has every right to. But thankfully, it says God loves his creation and does not want to kill them. So the animal's life is symbolically offered as a ransom payment that would cover them. The word cover is literally mean, the meaning of the Hebrew word kipper. Uh, if you hear the word Yom Kippur, it is the day of atonement. It is a, it is a time of atonement. It is a time of covering of sins. Uh, and it says that is a, the kipper. The word is English as atonement. The end result is that God's presence stays squarely in the midst of the people of Israel. The only way that God would stay in the midst of his people is if there was some form of atonement, if there was some price that was paid, if they could see the debt that they had done, if they could see the sin that they had done, and there was something that would cause them to realize this is what we want God in our presence, we want God in our midst, and this is what it's going to cost for that to happen, and that's going to be what it costs for God to stay in the midst of us, is that we got to recognize when we sin. we got to recognize what we've done wrong. And we've got to lay that sin and get an atonement for it through the sacrificial ritual that we're doing. And we're to remember the next time not to do sin. But as I said, it just became, they began to be numb. I want you to listen to some of these here in a, uh, just for a little bit. Think of all the, the, the sacrifices that they have. You ever get to, to the place you read in the law, you read in the Old Testament, you read uh, in the four, first five books of the law, you begin to, to read, especially Leviticus is one of them, but it's in other places as well where they talk about, it's in numbers here that I'm going to mention this morning, about the sacrifices that were to be made. If you ever get to reading it, and you, sometimes you just get to the place where you're like, oh my goodness. <laughs> And you get overwhelmed. You're like, oh my, you're reading this and you think you're done and you get, it goes back in and if this happens, this is what you got to do. And it's over and over and over again. God explains this is what you do when you have sinned. There was daily sacrifices. Numbers 28 and 3 tells us that it is an offering made by fire which you will offer unto the Lord two lambs of the first year without spot, day by day, a continual burnt offering, day by day, morning and evening, day by day, you make a sacrifice for sin. It talks about the, the weekly Sabbaths on Numbers 28 and 9. It says, and on the Sabbath day, this, this is not... Don't stop the day by day and do this on the Sabbath. No, you do the day by day. And you do this also on the Sabbath day. Two lambs of the first year without spot. It says mingled for a, with flour for a meat offering and mingled with oil for a drink offering thereof. The Sabbath had its own for sin. Every day and on the Sabbath. Every day and on the Sabbath. Sacrifices for sin. Sacrifices on top of sacrifices. Think about this. Then there was the months or the new moons. There were six total in the Jewish year. Numbers 28, 11 tells us, In the beginnings of your months you shall offer a burnt offering unto the Lord, two young bullocks and one ram, seven lambs of the first year without spot. Now that's not to mention the times that they had to do the annual assembly occasions. If Leviticus, we find here the following, uh, there's other, if you go from Numbers to Leviticus, you find out there's a burnt offering. There's a cereal or a, what they call a meal offering. Uh, there's a peace offering, a sin offering, a sin offering with restitution, a guilt offering, and a consecration offering. Now, some of these offerings were uh, as a way, uh, uh, as just a, out, of the, out of our heart, as just an act of worship. Some of these offerings were made as an act of worship uh, to freely give unto God and to freely give unto the Lord. But there was many of them that dealt with sin. You know, it got to where, you know, he, he talks about lambs, it talks about bullocks, it gets to the place where it talks about if you got two turtle doves, you know, if you got doves, uh, take them and sacrifice for sin. All of these things over and over again. Could you imagine what you would have had to have done 
to have God's presence with you. The work that you would have. Either one, you'd have to get real good at not sinning. But there wasn't a way to change the heart. The law couldn't do it. The law could only show us what we were doing wrong. You know, you can write, you know, when you look at Congress, you can look at our own communities. Man, there's, there's laws on the books that, that probably should have expired 150 years ago, but they're still on the books. Nobody wipes them off. Everybody writes laws and writes laws. You can write a law against everything there is wrong in this world and everything that is wrong in society, but it'll never change the heart. That's what had happened with the children of Israel. It didn't change the heart. So what had to happen? Hebrews 10 tells us this, For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things that can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year, continually make the comers thereunto perfect. It wasn't going to do it. It wasn't going to cleanse them. It wasn't going to wash them. It wasn't going to change their heart. It wasn't going to renew their mind. All it was going to do was show them what the cost was going to be. And the cost was blood. And the cost was a life. Oh my, this morning. If we would that it said they, they not have ceased been offered, would they have not have stopped? Because the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sin. But it says, but in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. It was for our learning. It was for our understanding. It was for the children of Israel to understand the cost that was about to be paid. And, and I look at this this morning, and this is where we get into the, the meat of this morning's sermon, if you will. That there was, a, there was, as you can say, there was a sin that was a curse. It caused separation. There was a sin that's penalties. The, 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 the definition of its penalty was death. But I want to know this morning, the death of sin was the cross. This morning, the death of sin is the cross of Calvary. Uh, uh, there's a lot of people, I, I believe, that you see this morning. Uh, we find there's a lot of people in this world, especially in the Christian church, uh, and especially in America, they don't think that sin stops uh, at Calvary. Uh, they think they sin more or less every day. But I'm here to tell you this morning, if your blood, sins are underneath the blood, if you're forgiven, if you're a new creature in Christ, if you've been born again, I'm here to tell you that sin dies at the cross. Amen. Sin stops at the cross. It doesn't mean that we can't fail. It doesn't mean that we can't sin. But Christ's nature is now in us. He lives and abides and dwells in us. Sin has no longer a captive audience, if you will. It no longer holds you captive to commit those sins which are out there. If we walk in Christ, that's why the Bible tells us to walk in the Spirit and you not shout out and fulfill the lust of the flesh. If we're walking with Jesus, those temptations are still going to come. They may flood your eyes. They may flood your ears. They may flood your mind. But I'm here to tell you by the grace and the Spirit of the Lord that Christ walking within you, you don't have to fulfill those desires and you don't have to fulfill that sin nature that comes against Against you because sin dies at the cross it stops right there where Jesus died this is John 19 and 7 it said the Jews answered him we have a law and by our law he ought to die because he made himself the son of God when Pilate therefore heard that saying he was more afraid and he went again into the judgment hall and said unto Jesus Whence art thou? In other words, where'd you come from? Who are you? This, I believe it shook Pilate to his very core. I believe his mind was wondering. I, I believe his mind was wanting to believe. I believe he knew that he was looking at the Son of God. I believe he trembled at the thought. To, and he asked you, Jesus, who are you? Who are you? Where did you come from? But Jesus gave him no answer. It says, Then said Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee and have power to release thee? 
And Jesus answered him this way. He said, Thou couldst not have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. Here he let G Jesus let Pilate know this was not his power. This was not Pilate's authority. But he was letting him know that Jesus said, I lay my life down. In John 10 and 17 it says, Therefore doth my father love me because I lay my life down. He said, but that I may take it up again this morning. We see that Jesus told Pilate, you think you're in control. You think you have power. But this is not about you, Pilate. This is because I'm coming that the world may have an atonement for their sins. This is me coming that I lay, I'm laying my life down. Not you, Pilate. And I'm going to give my life for the world. You can read over in John one of the things that I believe is John chapter 18. One of the things that I love about it with John when he talks about they come with Judas and all of them came and they began to, to he began to come up to Jesus and, and Jesus asked them who they were looking for and they told him Jesus of Nazareth and he said I am he and when he spoke I am he every one of them tumbled to the ground and fell backward on the ground. He did not have to be taken by force. He went willingly. And here he tells Pilate, you don't have the power to crucify me, but I'm laying my life down. This thing was not about you. It's about a greater work that my heavenly Father is getting ready to do. Jesus said, this commandment have I received of my Father. I got the power to lay it down and I'm going to have the power to pick it back up again. Aren't you thankful for that today? Ephesians tells us this, that He has chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world. Hebrews 4 and 3 tells us that although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, this day that Jesus came, this day that Jesus died on the cross for you and for I, you know, you, as I said a few weeks ago, every one of us in here, we were thought of before the foundations of the world was ever made. We were going to be birthed in this world. You want to know that you have purpose and you got to know that you got reason for living in this world. It's because God had it planned that way. We might not understand understand it. The devil may say that you ain't worthy of anything. The devil may say that your life ain't worth anything. But I'm here to tell you, God has a purpose in your life. God has a reason for you to be here. God has a purpose that you could know Him. More importantly, that you can have a fellowship with Him, that you can have a right relationship with Him from the foundations of the earth. God knew that Adam and Eve weren't going to cut it. He knew that whoever He put in the Garden of Eden were going to fail. He knew that sin was going to enter into the world and He had already made provision for sin. There was going to come an atonement. You say, how can you say this? How can you preach this way? Because I know that my God is perfect. I, I know that my God, he, he does all things well. There's nothing that catches Him by surprise. He knows everything that is going on in this world and He's still on the throne. Amen. We go ahead and we read down a little bit further in John 19. It says a Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not a friend of Caesar's. So when Pilate heard therefore the saying, he brought Jesus forth and he sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement. But in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was the preparation of the Passover and about the sixth hour. And he saith unto the Jews, Behold, your king. But they cried out, Away with him. Crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then delivered he to them, therefore to be crucified. And they took Jesus and they led him away. Now, I think so many times we look at this story and we wonder how could anyone have cried out, crucify him for anyone in particular, really, but for our Lord and our God. How could we have 
How could anybody, you know, we look at it and we say, how could anybody have cried out crucify to Jesus? How could anybody have said, no, to, to crucify and get rid of him, destroy him? This man who'd done no sin, this man who'd healed the, the lame and the deaf and the ones that could not see, he touched the, those that were dead and raised them to life. How could anyone say, crucify him? But Jesus was right in his saying in Matthew 12 and 34. He said, O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. What was being spoken was the abundance of the heart. There was no salvation. Man. Just in Noah's day, they said their thoughts was continually evil. Here again, we look at this scripture this morning. In the abundance of the heart, the mouth was speaking. Crucify him. If you would have been there, you said, I would never have done that. Oh, yes, you would have. Oh, yes, I would have. The abundance of our heart was sin. The abundance of our heart, we, we, out of the abundance of our heart, we would have spoke because there was no remedy for sin. There was without a doubt, this is a true saying, and out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh because we needed a Savior. Just like the demons who cried out the truth of who Jesus was, the Son of God, humans before a holy God, we speak what's in our heart. John 1 and 3 tells us this. All things were made by Him and without Him was not anything that made that was made. In Him was life and His life was the light of men and the light shineth in darkness and the dark, darkness comprehended it not. Whoever was there crying crucify, they didn't comprehend who He was. They didn't know He was the Son of God. They didn't believe. They didn't understand. They had no comprehension of what they were doing they were in their sins. They were in darkness. There was no light in their life because Jesus hadn't arose from the grave yet. John 3 and 19 tells us that this the light is coming to the world, but men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Men like darkness better than light. They don't like light shining on them. You ever seen a night creature or a night animal, they get light shining on them, they don't like it. That's how we are with sin. When light is shining on us, we don't like it. That's why they cried out, crucify him. Crucify him. John 19 and 17, it says this, And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him with two others with him on either side, one, Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. In closing this morning, this point of the sermon was titled The Death of Sin is the Cross. For truly sin has no hold on the person who has been redeemed. If you're redeemed by the blood of Jesus, sin has no hold on you. You don't have to sin. You don't have to continue in sin. That bondage was broken. When they pierced Jesus' side. That bondage was broken when they nailed his hands and his feet to the cross. And when you came to faith and believing in Jesus as the Son of God, that's the point of sin's dominion over you. Sin doesn't have dominion over you this morning because of the cross of Calvary. You are free. You are free this morning. There's been an atonement. So this morning we ask or we say, let the church arise from sins past, sins of disobedience or omission, 
Sin and, and to remember the cross and the price that was paid to be set free. If I could close with any thought this morning, I want you to remember this. Sin brought the curse of death. Death was the penalty for sin. And Jesus' death brought the cure for sin. All this, this morning, that you and I can write, be free. Let us arise from sin. Let the church arise out of sin. What does that mean this morning? To me, it can mean different things. I believe the church needs to arise out of sin and realize who Jesus is, what price he paid. You know, it's time that the church begins to remember what Jesus price that he paid. It's time to, to remember the blood. You know, there's many times that people don't want to remember the blood. They don't want to remember the sacrifice. There's many people that will only come to church only at Christmas time anymore because they want to remember Jesus as a baby in a manger. But he was no longer in that manger for just a little while. But he, he was on the cross for you and I. He was on the cross that we could have atonement. He was on the cross so that we could have peace. Let's stand this morning. I believe this Easter season that God has given us, I, I am more than grateful. I, I don't know how to express what it feels like to be in the house of God. And I don't know what I'm going to do on Easter Sunday. And you say, well, you should be that way every time the church doors are open and I, and I have to agree with you. After last year, you know, we weren't able to be in, in the house of God for Easter to worship Him, to realize that He is alive and He is risen from the tomb. So this, this Easter to me is, is more special than it's ever been in a long time because last year we couldn't meet together. We couldn't celebrate together. But I believe God is calling as this series of, of these series of, of, of sermons, if you will, this Easter series to let us arise to prayer as I talked about last week. The church needs to dig into prayer. Uh, this, this morning, uh, God's speaking to us. Let us arise from sin. You know, I'm not saying you've sinned. I'm not saying there's sin in your heart. But I'm just saying, trying to tell you this morning, sin has no hold on you. Sin does not, if you're redeemed, if you're bought by the blood of the Lamb, sin has no power over you. Let the church arise from sins. Let the church arise from their past and walk boldly in the future. Hey, sin does not hold you down. It's not going to bind you. It's not going to keep you. 